Thank you for bringing us to the hospital. Thank you for everybody who came to your church. You have been constant and wonderful presence in love theory. Well, he's the longest I have been inspired of love theory. And uh, yeah, he's done some amazing results in love theory, but it feels like it's a subject to always be fascinated by and scared to dig into. So, uh, yeah, welcome. Thank you for your presentation. And let's talk about how any functions on order of other things. That's right. Okay. Right. Well, uh, thank you very much, Paul. That was very kind. <laughs> and um, yes, I was wondering if I could say something about uh, the, the slum. Uh, this is my second time to give a talk at the slum. And I'm very grateful for the opportunity and I thank, for, thank the organizers very much for inviting me. It's wonderful to be here in this beautiful country. And um, I guess I did not do such a bad job the last time around. So that's so why you invited me again. Uh, I talked at the Salt 15th uh, Salon meeting in uh, Bogota in 2012, almost exactly 10 years ago. And my talk then was called Model Theory and Motivic Integration. And I will continue from where I left off last time. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, actually, the, uh, the only thing the two talks have in common is that they're both about value fields, which is the subject that I have uh, been working with all of my career. And um, I, I mentioned the first talk uh, only because I, it's the, the subject area I consider to be very applied model theory. So in the sense that motivic integration is this concept which is defined, and then the, uh, shortly before I gave that talk, there's a lot of proof by Novak Chow of the um, fundamental lemma in the Langlands program, which used a transfer principle, which came from thinking about motivic integration model theoretically. So the whole idea was developed from totally mathematically, but there was model theory that came in in order to kind of make it all come together. So that's what I think of as being very applied model theory. So this talk is going to be more in the sense of classical applied model theory, um, by which I mean, we, we start with a something, a mathematical theory, mathematical objects that are defined by um, first, first order axioms. And we think of a language in which we can write down those axioms and express that theory. And we choose a language in which the definable sets are somehow tractable. Um, and yes, yeah, so both mathematically interesting and, and model theoretically tractable. And that tractability can be what, whatever it is that we have kind of model theoretically. So classically, that would be elimination of quantifiers. Um, more recently, maybe elimination of imaginaries or other kinds of continuous properties, which I'll mention as we go along. And then we use that to derive other mathematical properties. So the sort of paradigm example of this, it comes from the work of Tarski on, on real closed fields. And the, uh, the theory of real closed fields, so that is a field which has an ordering which respects the, the, uh, the addition and multiplication of the field, and for which that's, then that's to be a real field, to be real closed, the closure property is that if you take any uh, algebraic, it's the, your, your field has an ordering, and there is no algebraic extension of the field, which also has an ordering. So it's kind of maximal with, with respect to having an ordering. And we write down that theory in the language for which we have addition and multiplication and a symbol for the ordering, then we get a um, quantifier elimination. But the, uh, the choice of the language is important here. We have to we could write down the theory of real closed fields without including the ordering, but then we uh, we don't get quantifier elimination. So it's ne necessary to add the ordering in order to get quantifier elimination. And that's something which makes sense uh, from the mathematical point of view, because the the fields, the, the sets which are definable without quantifiers are the so-called semi-algebraic sets. So that is uh, sets which are defined with the condition of the form polynomial is equal to zero or a polynomial is greater, greater than or equal to zero. And then the, um, the fact that you have quantifier elimination says that uh, the that collection of sets is closed under projection. And so you get a, uh, a collection of sets that you can study either from the 
uh, is of interest mathematically, at least if you're a semi algebraic <laughs> geometer. And it is tractable from a model theoretic point of view because we have the quantifier elimination. And then uh, we get more information about the mathematically because uh, we can write down something like the interior or the boundary of a semi algebraic set that's defined by a formula with quantifiers. And then the quantifier elimination tells us that that fact is semi algebraic. So this is just a very, and then you can use it for one, for one from there. And I find this a sort of very beautiful example of the way that, that model theory works. Now, what I want to do, two different things to go on from here. One is to think about adding analytic functions. Analytic functions are, of course, defined as a function which is infinitely differentiable or convergence or given by its power series. And that's something that we cannot say in the first order way. So we have to think, well, how can we uh, use our model theoretic or first order techniques in order to study those kinds of theories? But then the other thing I want to do is to move away from the example of real closed fields to talk about value fields. So let me uh, move, move, go on to value fields, maybe a, a less familiar example of the kind of structure that mathematical structure that we might want to look at. Just realized that I'm holding my I'm holding the microphone in my left hand because I can't easily look at my watch. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, Okay, so uh, the, the value fields are again very actually very natural objects uh, mathematically, and the algebraic theory has been studied in, in uh, from a model theoretic point of view, starting with the work of Max Fisher and also Gershoff, and I guess that was the late sixties. So just a quick definition of value value field is a field with a field K with a valuation function. This is not the same kind of valuation function that we we're hearing about yesterday. Where the valuation gave a uh, true or false. Here, our valuation is intended to give us some notion of size in the field. Uh, we fix a, a, a ordered group gamma, and uh, the valuation is a function which is a homomorphism from the. Okay, so it's a homomorphism from the multiplicative structure of the field to the added structure of the group. It's subadded in that the valuation of x plus y should be greater than or equal to the minimum of the valuation of x and the valuation of y. And it actually follows that if these two have a different valuation, then it's equal to the minimum. And the um, zero is the only element of valuation infinity, which we add, add to the uh, group. So when we're thinking of valuation as giving us a notion of size, then uh, being small. Our, our intuition is that something is small if it's close to zero. And since zero has valuation infinity, to be small is to have large valuation. So the, the, gamma, the value of gamma is a, is a large value. So it's, that, that's kind of, it's switched over from our usual sense of, of, of the order. So just to keep that in mind, large, large gamma, large valuation means a small size, close to zero. Now, <laughs> If my field K also has an ordering, then we'll say that it's, it's uh, the valuation is convex with respect to the ordering. If for all my X and Y, if X is less than Y and they're both positive, then the valuation of X is greater than or equal to the valuation of Y. So we're switching over again the, to be X is smaller than Y if its valuation is something which is larger. And the valuation gives us additional algebraic structure on our field. Uh, we have the elements of valuation greater than or equal to zero. We call it that's that's turns out to be a ring, which is called a valuation ring. The elements of uh, you know, valuation strictly greater than zero is a, an ideal, in fact, it's a maximal ideal in the valuation ring. And so if I quotient the ring by its maximal ideal, then I get a field, and that's called I'll call little k for the residue field. And if the valuation is convex with respect to an ordering, if I have ordering ground, then the, <laughs> sense, the valuation rings and the maximal ideal are both convex in the sense that if I take two elements of the valuation ring for which x is less than y to something which lies between them, then that element also has to be in the valuation ring. So, um, and then because of this property, we see that we can define, we can induce an ordering on the residue field 
defined in the obvious way that it, um, I just pick a representative of the, of the equivalence of the quotient and use the ordering. <laughs> and if you get bored with the rest of the talk, then you can go through the calculation to see that that's, that actually is well defined. So with evaluation, we also get a topology on the field. Uh, we choose as the basis of open sets the set of elements x for which the evaluation of x minus a is greater than or equal to alpha. We call this a closed ball, closed just because of the weakened ball in here. Um, that's uh, center a and radius alpha. And now this, this notion of, of radius comes out a little strange because the uh, the closed ball center zero radius zero, that is valuation of x minus zero greater than equal to zero, is exactly the valuation ring. And so that's quite a large set. And, and something of, I can think of a, a single point as being a closed ball center infinity, valuation of x minus a greater than equal to infinity, so that's just x equals a. Um, yeah, so that gives us a topology. And Okay, so that's a whole bunch of definitions that I just gave you. Let's uh, look at an example, which I think is, is, a, is a very natural example in order to get a sense of, of what all this stuff looks like. So I, I really like this example, the, the, the Han series. So what I do is to fix uh, a field called we'll little k and an ordered group, and we take formal power series in the indeterminate t. So I allow coefficients in from little t, the field of k, and then take t to the gamma and just take all power series as little gamma ranges over the value. Uh, with the condition that the support of the series, that is, those uh, elements gamma for which the coefficient is non zero, is a well ordered set. And with that uh, condition, I can take these, these sets and I can define a formal addition on, on these, these series, just uh, adding pointwise. And I can define a multiplication in the way that you think it should work, which is if I take the product of two series, then the, the uh, coefficient of t to the gamma in the product should be the sum over the coefficients a delta the product of a delta v epsilon such that delta plus epsilon adds up to gamma. And this is, is a finite sum, and therefore this for construction makes sense. Precisely because of this condition on the well ordering of the support, so that makes it work. And then I, of course, need to check that I have multiplicative inverses, but we do, and then this gives us a field. And it very naturally, this field very naturally has a valuation, which is to say, well, let's pick out the, uh, the least element of that support. So the valuation is just the, the, um, the minimum of the support of, of the element. So the, the least gamma with a non-zero coefficient. And then you can see that if um, this respects the multiplication, the um, evaluation of the product will be just the least term that we get here. And we get that uh, sub-additivity or super-additivity that the uh, valuation of the sum will be the minimum of the two, because that's the minimum for which I get something here, unless the minimum occurs at the same and these two cancel, in which case the valuation will go up. So we get a very natural uh, valuation there. And of course, I've chosen the notation that the, the valuation is a map to, to capital gamma, so gamma is the value term. And if I take the elements of valuation greater than or equal to zero, that's those power series which start at zero. The, the valuation, the uh, maximal ideal is those elements which have start just after zero. And so if I take if I quotient one by the other, then I get exactly the coefficients at zero. So that's Little k, so little k is the residue. And if the field of little k is ordered, then the ordering can be extended to all of k to the Hahn series. Uh, actually, I can extend it any way I want. I just have to choose the cut for the element t for the indeterminate t. But the one way which makes if I choose t to be positive in an in infinitesimal, so uh, greater than zero, but less than any other real number or any other number in little k, then this gives me a valuation which is convex with respect to the order. So that's the kind of example that I want to keep in mind. Okay, so now we get to the picture. 
So we can draw a picture of um, any any time you have a set of power series, you can you can draw a picture as, as a tree. Uh, but then this this picture as tree fits with the topology when it's a with, in the in the valuation topology. So if I draw the value here, and then I think about it, I have some power series and it's it's, it's going along with, with, with gamma, but then I, at some valuation, at some point, I, I get the, the minimum support. So that's a gamma zero here. And at that point, I have a non zero coefficient. So I have some non zero coefficient that's my a sub gamma zero. And then I go along for a little while until I get the next non zero coefficient, and I branch off in some other direction. And that will be my a sub gamma one direction. And I have here gamma one, and then I go along, and so I continue on, on in this way until I get to my A, which is the sum of gamma greater than new gamma sub zero of A sub gamma to the gamma. So I can, uh, then maybe I have some other element B, and maybe it agrees with A for the first few coefficients, and then until, until somewhere where it does not, and then I have some B, and if I look at that and I see that where they where they first differ will be the valuation of their difference. So right here I'll have this, this will be the valuation of A minus B. And then I can look in general and can see it all as being those elements for which the valuation is of X minus A. So I, I can see it here. Some ball, everything. This is um, the, the valuation of x minus a is greater than or equal to this, uh, this ball right alpha right there, is greater than or equal to alpha. So we can see the topology in the, in the tree of the power series. And then if I add in ordering, so I, let me actually say this one more thing here. If I pick my, my, if I take there to be valuation zero. Then everything that branches off um, the, the maximum ideal here. I'm just choosing a different color so you guys see what's happening. The maximum ideal is everything that branches off from zero right here. Oh, sorry, that's the evaluation ring. So this is oh, everything which branches at the evaluation ring equal to zero. The maximum ideal inside it is everything which is valuation strictly greater than zero. So there's M. The maximal ideal. And when I quotient one by the other, what I get are copies of the maximal ideal sitting there inside the valuation. And then the, um, so what we see is that the quotient is the residue field. And I get the, um, all of these, the, the choices of the direction in which I, in which I branch are precisely the value, the, the, the maximum, the residue field. And so the residue field is sitting there as being either the open balls with all possible centers, uh, radius uh, strictly greater than zero, or also the, the, the possible coefficients for branching. And so what I have is I see that picture repeated all over the tree. If I choose some other point here, and I look at the, the, the closed ball, the variation of x minus a greater than equal to alpha, if I push it out by the valuation of x minus a strictly greater than alpha, then again, I'm going to see a copy of the res residue field in that branch. And if I put an ordering on the field, so I put an ordering on my residue field, let me just draw another picture over here. So I get here's the valuation zero. Then when I look at that branching, I can see that branching as, as being a choice of direction here. So I, I, I can see this is, this is not just a this this kind of branching, but it's also an ordered set. So this this element is actually less than that one. And if I put that on my entire field, what I've done is I've got my ordered field up here. So my field K with an ordering on it. I have zero of the field, and I've got my element T, which is um, which is. Uh, infinitesimal positive, so I put it to the right of zero, it's positive, but it's infinitesimal, it's less than everything else. And if I look at where its valuation is, that's something which has to come down here. It has to have 
valuation strictly greater than zero. So here I have valuation of t. I think of it as being equal to one in my in my Hahn series example. But this is, could happen much more generally as well. I mean, this picture really is a, is a any value field. Although it's, uh, I, I fixed it as being the Hahn series for one reason. So um, we have this kind of image of the the ordered field up there on top with this tree lying below it, which is fitting into it. And then when I take, say, the valuation ring, in this situation where I have the ordering, so again, my valuation ring is something which is all the way up here. The reals or the, 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 the kind of finite elements are everything inside here. If I take something like an interval from minus one to one, then that's something which is well inside the valuation ring. Okay, so with that picture in mind, try to help us understand what we're doing with our value, value fields. If, uh, if I have a situation in that, in still in the Han series example, if my residue field is algebraically closed, and my value group is divisible, which of course is a picture that I can't draw with it because I have to draw a divisible value group. Um, then the the Hahn series will will form an algebraically closed value field. So it actually will be algebraically closed as well as many values, and we call this theory ACBF. If I take instead my residue field to be real closed, so it has an ordering, so if we that will come that will be the ordering of the entire field, and then we get a an example of a real close convex value field, and the theory is called RCTF. And both of these are nice theories, so to kind of the point. So, but we think of this as being the, anal the, the analogy to the real closed fields, where we now have a real closed value field or an algebraic closed value field, and they both have quantifier elimination. You know, if, if we write down the right language, and there's various choices of language that we can use, but they basically no matter which one you choose, it's a good choice. They all work. And also, they both have elimination of imaginaries in the language where we have to add sorts, but I'm not really going to talk about that. I just mentioned that in passing. And then, but we can use quantifier elimination to also get uh, further tameness problems. So, tameness is a kind of terminology that's been that's come into all theory in the last well, 20 years, I guess. Quite a long time, um, but the um, it's a sort of an, getting a, an understanding of the geometric properties of the definable sets, which are in a way which gives you control over the definable sets altogether. So the first kind of classic result in this is, is that the theory of real closed fields is O minimal, order minimal. That is, every definable one, every definable set in one variable is definable just using the ordering. And so it's a finite unit you know, of points and intervals. That's not going to be true in a value field because, of course, in the value field, I have uh, I have to have the valuation, which is the valuation ring. And the valuation ring itself is going to be a set which is okay, which is convex here with respect to the ordering, but it's certainly not an integral because it doesn't have endpoints. So, but what we do get instead is weak O-minimality, and that is that. Uh, every definable set in one variable is a finite union of points and convex sets. So that's kind of as good as you can get, given that you have sets which are certainly not going to be integrals. And the theory of algebraically closed value fields has a property called C minimality. Um, I will explain why we call it C, but uh, every definable set in one variable is a finite Boolean combination of walls. So our definable sets here, rather than being just the uh, intervals that you could get along the, from, from the, the field of the, the line here, the ordered line. Um, the definable sets would turn out to be uh, a ball, say, the uh, valuation ring, with finitely many balls removed. So, say, remove the maximum ideal, and then that gives you the well, ball minus n. It's hard to see in that picture, but it's what it could look like. So, that again gives us control over the definable sets in one variable. Which also then has strong consequences for this structure of the final sets in one one variable. And then this gives us a lot of power for understanding the, the, the geometry of those sets and working them. Okay, so that's the algebraic structure that I want to be looking at. 
And I want to ask the question, well, how do we add analytic functions? How do we study analytic functions with using the same kinds of techniques and, and, and methods that we have from all three? So the, of course, the, the, these analytic functions are not going to be definable in, in the algebraic structures that we've written down. The functions that we can define are polynomials and, and things like that come from polynomials. So in order to look at analytic functions, we have to find some other way to do it. And so the method which is used is, is, is to say, well, let's make our structure rich, richer. Let's add function symbols for more complicated functions. And those function symbols could be then, we can choose to interpret them by analytic functions and in, in, uh, on the domain that we're interested in. So that's uh, been a, a, a pursuit of model theory for, again, for, for a long time. And I want, what I want to say in, in, is to sort of describe it in very general terms and then see how that gets realized in particular instances. So the, uh, the, very, the very general thing to say is, let's uh, suppose that has the field. It's uh, got some topology on it and that is complete with respect to that topology. So I can, I can talk about convergence. And then let's look at the ring of this formal power series, which have coefficients in K, uh, take X to be a um, multivariable here. And then let's take curly A to be some, some subset of the formal power series. So what set exactly did we take? Uh, it was going to be sort of part of the discussion. So what we can do then is for any formal power series in my collection that I've, I've chosen to be of interest, uh, but if suppose we have such a formal power series which converges on some closed and bounded set in K to the N, then we can define a function from F, we call it F hat, which is just given by the formal power series if X is in the set on which the, the function, the power series converges, and just make it zero if it's outside. And that's what we call a restricted analytic function. So it's given by a power series of some subset of its domain, and then we just cut it off. So then given some ring language of interest, so ordered fields or value fields or whatever it is, we can add function symbols as our functions range over this collection of power series that we said we're interested in. And then assume that the function symbols are interpreted in the standard model by these functions that happen. So then the question becomes, well, from what nice theories in some language and for what nice choices of functions or interesting choices of functions, do we still get a nice theory, something that we can work with? Yeah. Does the D take you that point to say people? Uh, the D could um, could be could be dependent on the S. Although generally what we usually do is we if D is going to be sort of constant throughout, but but it could depend on us. So what is bounded? Sorry? What is bounded? Bounded, well, uh, yeah, that's a good question, actually. I guess I'm running it because yeah, I'm, that's to say bounded kind of assumes that I have an ordering around. <laughs> yeah, okay. For the moment, let's just say some close to set. Okay, so if we take uh, if we do this over the over the reals, and we take a collection of power series that converge on an open neighborhood of the unit box, which is a nice close and bounded set, <laughs> then um, this is the classical work of uh, Gabriel F. and Ben F. and Ben and Reese, who proved that the L sub A theory is, is small, complete, and or minimal. Uh, okay, that's not exactly the way it was expressed originally. That's kind of the modern way of saying what they were doing. Uh, the theory of ordinality really took off when Wilkie proved that if we take A to be just a single function, the exponential function, then that, that theory is small, complete, and minimal. Okay, so these are sort of two nice examples of which got, got all this started of getting a, an interesting collection of functions and then getting out of it a theory which is really nice and has nice properties. So, so the minimality means that we can work with it. And the, the theory of open minimality has gone on to develop many, many more examples of expansions of, of the reals by analytic functions, different classes of analytic functions, or, or even different classes of other collections of functions, which, which are still are minimal. And so you get lots of interesting things that you can do. But one thing that we can, can observe is that when I 
I take this collection of the restricted analytic functions. Of course, what we want to then do is to look at a non standard model, because that's sort of the point. We're not just looking at the reals, we're looking at all models of the theory. And so there will be models of the theory in which there are infinite elements. And this gives us naturally evaluation, where we take the evaluation ring to be the finite elements, so those elements that are bounded by the real number. And so we can. Uh, there, there is, you know, comes with a evaluation. So we can say, well, suppose we add a symbol for that valuation. So say the symbol for the valuation ring and put that into our language and, and then ask what happens. So this was uh, what uh, Van der Dries and Lohenberg called a T-convex theory. So that is, I have some base theory, say the restricted analytic functions on, on the reals. And then I have this valuation which I'm adding, and I have some kind of assumption about the way the, uh, the functions behave with respect to the valuation. That's what a T convex statement is. And then we get a theory which is um, weakly O minimal. Of course, as soon as I put in the valuation ring, it's not going to be O minimal anymore because I have that final set over there, which is the valuation ring. But I do get in, I, sort of the, the next best possible, which is that it's weakly O minimal. So even though I've added all of these, these extra functions, I still have the fact that the definable sets in one variable are just finite units of points and integrals. So that's a very strong observation. So um, in the early 2000s, Raskobi Peters and Sergei Starchenko had this very beautiful work where they said, well, let's look at the, try to understand the complex analysis of a non-standard uh, algebraically closed field. And what they, what they did was to think of it as, as R cross R, where R is a non standard real closed field. And to look at the complex analysis, they looked at precisely at these restricted analytic functions and then used the fact that you had that as the restricted analytic functions, um, that that theory is O minimal in order to uh, be able to understand um, limiting, limit properties of, of, of the functions and to develop a complex analysis. So, is a very um, remarkable piece of work. And what I was thinking about with Paolo Cubides is, well, what, what could we do something analogous to understand the complex analysis of an algebraically closed value field? So put the valuation on there and then have this, um, think, think of our algebraically closed value field as being R cross R, where R is a real closed value field. And say, okay, so what is the complex analysis? Now, um, you might say, well, okay, we, we, we've already done that. We, we've got this uh, L sub A theory of R, it's weakly O minimal, use the weak O minimality, and then understand the behavior of the analytic functions on R cross R, which is this, say, your, your um, algebraically closed field. But I don't think that's the right thing to be looking at. And anyway, that's what Peter Zell Starchenko already did, so I didn't want to do that. But the, um, the function symbols here are defined using the ordering. So the, the functions that we've chosen are power series that converge on an open neighborhood of the, of, of the box. So we have convergence in the sense of the ordering. But if we're going to look at really a complex analysis of an algebraically closed value field, we should be thinking about the um, convergence in the sense of the valuation rather than in, in the sense of the ordering. So there should be some different collection of functions that we're looking at. So we can't just use the fact that we know that, that we have that uh, we go in value here because it's not the right set of functions. So what, what does it what difference does it make if we have the um, if we have if we think about convergence in the sense of the valuation instead of in the sense of the ordering? So let's fix a complete value field and we take uh, uh, a power series and think about what does it mean to converge. Of course, that should mean that the sequence of partial sums is a Cauchy sequence in the standard way. So to be a, a Cauchy sequence, that means if I take the difference of, of the partial sums, then that should be getting smaller. Remembering that getting smaller in the valuation means get, getting larger, so getting close to zero. So getting this to be getting close to zero means that it should be getting bigger than gamma. But if I take this difference, this has a finite sum, and the ultrametric property, the super additivity property of the sum means that this evaluation is given by or greater than or equal to the minimum 
of the valuation of each of these summands. So in order to force this to be greater than gamma, I just have to force that the evaluation of each of those terms, which is each of those summands, which is the valuation of f sub i plus i times the value of x, should go to infinity as i goes to infinity. So that's a much weaker condition than we normally have on a power series in order to get convergence. Right? This is like this is what your first year undergraduate students want to believe it's true. So um, suppose we want to get convergence on the maximal ideal. So if the valuation of x strictly greater than zero, well, if the valuation of x is greater than zero, that means that i times the valuation of x is going to go to infinity by itself. So I just need to make sure that the coefficients are not getting small. So they just have to have the valuation of f sub i down and below. So if I take some series like this one, just two to the i times x to the i, say in the Hahn series, where the valuation of two is equal to zero, then that's a nice convergent series. Or if I look at, if I want to get convergence on the valuation ring, valuation x greater than or equal to zero, Okay, these terms are no longer going to infinity, so I just have to make sure that these terms are going to zero to infinity. So I can take something like t to the i times x to the i, and that will be a convergence converge on the valuation ring. Or sometimes we, what we might want is to have convergence on something which is slightly bigger than the valuation ring, so that it's valuation of x greater than epsilon, where I'm thinking of epsilon being negative here. And then I can get something like um, I just have to get this i times epsilon, okay, now that might be getting large negative, so then I mean, by epsilon, it's actually getting large positive. So something like this series will converge on the, the ball, the open ball um, around radius minus two. So we get all of these new series that we hadn't really expected. Now I'm noticing in particular these because in the, uh, in the real case, we looked at series which converge on the open box, on the closed box, minus one, one to the end. And what you actually have to do is to have um, a series which converge on an open set containing the closed box. And so the, the kind of natural analogy in this case is for the, the valuation ring as a nice closed set, which we think of it to be kind of analogous to the interval minus one one. And so an open ball containing it would be say the, the valuation of x greater than something, something uh, negative. Right, so these, these, these series, which we call the overconvergent series, are, are in a way the, the ones which are most uh, naturally analogous to the restricted analytic functions in the, uh, in the classical Dinef van Dijk's proof. So these are the sort of the series that I want to look at. So there's a it sort of in, in the uh, 2000s, there was a uh, well, some work went on in looking at these kinds of series. Actually, uh, didn't include it, but the, the first result was one by Lipschitz from 93, I think. But um, here's something that was done in, in this direction, was to take, uh, again, our, our field of coefficients, a complete convexly valued ordered field, and taking A to be this collection of over-convergent series, and then Take the domain to be the, the box minus one, one to the n in, in this definition of my restricted analytic functions. So I have two things going on here now. I've got, I've got an ordering and evaluation. I'm taking my collection of functions to be those which are overconvergent in the sense of evaluation. But then I'm taking the domain to be this box minus one, one to the n, which is uh, defined using the order. And then there's this theorem by Lipschitz and, and Zach Robinson that the if we take the language of ordered fields, so leaving out the valuation, put in this collection of functions, which are defined on which, where's the interpretation in, in the standard model is this restricted analytic function on the interval minus one one, then I get a theory which has quantifier elimination and, and, and is open. So this is a really sort of odd result. I mean, it's, it's a nice result. We get this nice theory of quantifier elimination of minimality, but it's, a, it's an odd collection of functions. And to my mind, it's not the right collection of functions because we should not be restricting our domain to be this interval from minus one one. We should be doing something which is valuation definable, not interval definable. 
So what we wanted to, to what Pablo and I wanted to try to do was to say, no, that, that's not the collection of functions we want to be looking at. So what happens when you're trying to deal with, with these restricted analytic functions in, in this valuation in the final way is that we find that there are um, that there's things get complicated because dealing with the rate of convergence on the uh, valuation rate. And you, you don't have enough control. That's, that's really important. Yeah. So, in the work of um, Lipschitz in the early 90s, and then later on by Lipschitz and Tuckers, what they did is to work with two sorts of variables to try to keep track of convergence on either the maximal ideal or on the valuation rate. So, as we sort of saw in, in the examples, if I have um, power series in the range with, with coefficients which are with variables which are which I'm thinking of as ranging over the maximum ideal, then it's easy to get convergence because the, 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 the variables themselves if they get valuation strictly greater than zero until so the valuation will go to infinity to take powers over. So that's easy to get convergence. Whereas if I have my variables x which are ranging over the, the valuation ring, then I have to put more restrictions on the coefficients in order to make them go, make the series converge. So what we do is we take series which are given by convergent series over the valuation ring, and then we don't we just use any power series over the um, over the um, maximum ideal, but as I said, any power series, the coefficients are coming from here, so there's some control on their on the size of their of the of the of them as coefficients, in particular they have values greater than or equal to zero, so we get that down below. Then so we think of these as separated power series and have separated variables into those two sorts of variables. And then again, we as usual, we can define the restricted analytic function as being given by evaluating the function if the variables lie in the correct set, and then otherwise just set them equal to zero. And then what we can do is to take a collection that's a, a, all of those separate power series. And I, then I can say, well, which ones do I actually want to take? And we make a condition, we'll take some suffering, um, we just write down a whole bunch of them, and the things that we have to make sure um, in order to run the kind of proof that we want to do is that we have we, the, we take some subrings which contain the polynomial rings, for example, uh, have some natural compatibility. So if I, for instance, uh, increase the number of variables, if I add one variable and then take the projection, then I, then I, I get this, the uh, subring that I came from before. And then the key thing is that we have a fire strauss division. Myers-Strauss division of power series says that if you have your you have a power series which has a certain kind of regularity, then on some subset of its domain, if you look at it as a power series in the last variable, you can write it as a unit in all of the variables times a polynomial in the last variable. And that's the, the key thing which allows us to, to use to go through and see how that comes up. So then uh, Ralph Lucas and Leonard Richards were able to prove that we can take such a collection of functions and add them to our language, then in an algebraically closed value field, we get quantifier elimination and we get sigma value. And then what uh, Paolo and I were able to do is to say, okay, let's do that, but let's do it on an ordered value field. And we take then, we add, um, so we have a, a symbol for the ordering in our language, add all of those functions, and then we get a theory of a real close a convex and value field in this uh, analytic language. And this theory has quantifier elimination and is weakly omnipotent, which is the gross result that we wanted to say, okay, now we have a collection of functions for which will work. We've got some kind of attainment property, and we can then try to go ahead with our entire project. This is the, this is the starting result that we needed. So now we can go ahead and try to uh, finish it off. So um, uh, I'm just um, a few words on the proof here. We just did this uh, 
run through this very quickly for the experts. Um, it, it, it's it's a, a very um, a concrete quantifier elimination process. So what you have to do, as as in, as in all of these proofs, you have to eliminate one existential quantifier uh, from a formula and look at what your formula can be. Well, it's going to be a disjunct or conjunct of these atomic formulas. And what can you say? You'll have some terms which are given by functions, which involve these power series, which are included in the language. And we can say about them that they one function is less than or equal to another, and the term is less than or equal to another. We can write an evaluation condition on our terms, or we can write an equation. And then we use the Meyer Strauss preparation, just the sort of key thing which makes all this work, which is to write the terms in the formula in a way which is just a polynomial in the last variable. And we apply the algebraic quantifier elimination here into the last variable. That gives us our quantifier elimination. So it's always taking your, your analytic function and reducing it to a polynomial condition using Meyer Strauss preparation. And then, in order to get the in order to get the continuous um, uh, open and out, weak open and out, uh, we have to observe that we can take our terms in one variable and write them as a product of a rational function times a, a what we call a strong unit in the algebraic Euclid's field. So you go up to the algebraic Euclid's field uh, on a on certain subsets of the domain, but that those subsets are definable in, in the um, in the field uh, the field. And then again observe what our atomic formulas can be and see that either it's evaluation condition, so that's just you know, uh, the so I wrote it as a rational function times a unit. A unit has evaluation equal to zero or does or does not change sign. And so my evaluation conditions or uh, or order conditions are independent of the unit and just depend on the rational function. And so that can be made linear using either the semen amount or uh, using either the algebraic closure or the real closure. And that then gives us a good amount. Okay, so I'll just stop here. Questions? So, when you take out the right closure of your structure, are you in the setting of the digital forces? No. No. Mm -hmm. um, because the functions are defined using the order. Well, I got, so, I guess my question is yes, but does it include the setting of If you have a readout, Yes. Okay, yes. So when you, you, you got your theory, you go off to the algebraic closure, now you're in the set of the and problems. So you can apply C and now there. Yeah, and then pull it back. Okay. Thank you. Thank you again. And, uh, so the next event is going to be the first. Also, on part of one, so we'll see you in 10 minutes. Well, you will be the first session of the mini course called an introduction to construction scheme. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. And so I want to thank the organizers for letting me to send this mini course. Okay. Yeah, so we will be talking about construction. 
it's there going to see what's happening. It is uh, it's part of some work I'm doing with uh, with Stevo Kovacevic and a student uh, Jorge Cruz Chapita, which is my student and also my co-education. So, my Omega 1 will be the now the first component of cardinal. And the idea is this. Ah, okay. So, we will, uh, yeah. What we want to do is to construct some type of structure besides Omega 1. So, how can we do that? Well, there are several ways. So, I think the most straightforward is well, I want to build my structure of size omega one, I will do it by countable approximation. So, I uh, yeah. And at the end, you take the you do omega one many steps, and at the end, you take the union or some kind of limit, and that's what we want. A frequent feature of this type of constructions is that many of the approximations are elementary substructures of the final thing of the final structure you want, and well, you use elementality to put. Uh, what you want. Of course, uh, there are many other methods to build uh, this kind of structures. For example, one is a stable methods of box ordinals. Two others are what is called kind of uh, Kisler's absolute theorem. Well, not all of these are from CLC, but uh, Magidor and Malik serve as the realization of the key of this absolute theorem. And uh, well, there's also Porsche and some things called Morasses, which uh, okay. So, well, regarding this absolute and uh, well, two and three, these are like quite complicated stuff. So even frequently when people use two or three, let's say that they cheated because it's, it's quite complicated and the structure just appears magically. It's possible. And um, but Morasses is also another complicated technique. And uh, in fact, it has many things, uh, it has a, a lot of relationship with what I'm going to talk about. Um, but there's still more a lot of things to do. Uh, about this relationship. Okay, so construction and capturing schemes provide another method for building uncountable structures. And what's the idea in this? Well, in this approach, we look at finite soft structures. So, in the first approach, I mentioned it was countable. We now look at finite, finite ones. So this time the desired structure is obtained by performing several amalgamations of isomorphic finite structures. So like something that is possible to do, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, in the next talk, is like you can build, um, for example, a narrow shine tree or a gap uh, in a recursion of size omega. So if you look at the standard construction, it's a recursion of size omega one. What with this is possible to do it in omega many steps, which was for me was one of the things that I, it was very impressive for me. So it was one of the reasons I wanted to study this topic. Uh, 
Okay, so now the point is that many of the structural properties of the desire of contable structure that we're going to get reduce the problems in amalgamating its finance of structure. So, well, this slide may not make much sense right now, but once you know how it's, this type of constructions are done, you'll see that it makes sense. So, construction and capital schemes were introduced by Sebo in his paper, a construction scheme for lots of other structures. So, construction schemes are something you can do in CFC without extra assumptions and capturing uh, it's beyond CFC. So, now uh, if everything goes according to plan, which never does, but in the first lecture, we are going to see the definition of a construction scheme and its main properties. In the second, we will see some examples of using construction schemes, and in the third, which is the CFC one. And in the third one, we are going to see capture. Okay, so after the paper of demo, some other papers have been published by uh, Stevo from Getsu and Damian. So, uh, okay. I think there are five or Okay, so now construction scheme. We are going to see what is this. Well, just some basic notation. If I have a set X, then Xn is subset of size n. X, x squared less than omega is by x subset of omega of x. And uh, if I have two subsets of omega one, usually the one makes sense. By a less than b, we mean that every all of the elements of a are below all the elements, all the elements of a are below all the elements of b. And if I have two sets, we say that A is an initial segment of B, or B is a final and an end extension of A if it is contained, and the new elements of B appear after all the elements of A. Okay, so Right now, I'm not going to give you the full definition of construction scheme, but just like uh, a little approximation so that you have an idea of what's going to talk So, broadly speaking, a uh, construction scheme F will be a collection of finite sets of omega 1 such that, well, it has a composition in. F is the union of FK, K is omega, with the following properties. Okay, so the first step, the first layer, I just start with all the signatures. And the following four points. What is it? I want F to be cofinal in the finite subsets of omega 1. Uh, what does this mean? It means that whenever you pick a finite subset of omega 1, then there is an element in F that is B. We want all, all of the sets of, in FK or of rank K to have the same size. Now, if I pick two of the two elements in, in the same layer, in the same rank, then the intersection must be an initial segment of both. And here is, uh, if I have an n in fk plus one, then n will be obtained by gluing 
provide amalgamating. So elements that came in a very special way. Uh, this is what I'm not uh, designed to find at the moment. I will do it soon. But uh, I started I started with simple terms with the points. Now to get F2, I will put together some points. Then to get the elements of F3, I will put together some of the elements of F2 and so on. Okay, uh, another definition that probably many of you know. If I have a collection of finite sets, B, we say that S is a delta system with two P. If any two intersections of different types is so it looks like this when A alpha is this. So like in finite combinatorics, they usually call this uh, some flower. Okay, so now we need to see uh, the definition of type. Uh, this type uh, has nothing to do with the notion of type in modern theorics, another type of type. Okay, so a type will be a collection of uh, mk, mk plus one, rk plus one, all of these uh, natural numbers. So the n starts from zero, and the n uh, r starts from one. Okay, so m zero is one. Very easy. The n always must be at least two. Uh, for every n you choose, there are infinitely many k's, such as rk is n. So the r's cover omega, every point is covered infinitely many times. Uh, this is important for some of the proofs that we're going to, uh, for some of the proofs in this uh, topic. But if you forget for this lecture, it's not important. We are not going to use it. Okay, RK plus one is less than MK. And the last condition if K is bigger than zero, then we have this weird arithmetic relationship. Um, Okay, so well, formulas are good sometimes, but pictures are better. So soon I will give you the picture of this. Right now it was due some some of the relationship, but it has a very nice picture that, that you will understand right now. Okay. Yeah, so it looks it might look strange, but the first four conditions are very simple, but it seems quite random. And the last one is some strange arithmetic relationship. But everything will make sense. Yeah. Everything has a clear picture of why why we are doing that. Okay, so now we can. Uh, state the uh, definition of construction scheme. And well, just to have a repetition, every time I write this, this will always be a type. Okay, so now what is a construction scheme? You um, think really is a construction scheme, a scheme of some type. So it's a collection of finite subset of omega one which has a decomposition f union of fk with k in omega such that we start with all points, all singletons. I want it to be the final. Now, here is the first one. If f is in fk, then they have size fk. So this is the first number here. 
in particular, all the guys in the page are the same size. If I pick any two, the intersection is an initial segment of O. Uh -huh. And now before I told you that the ones from FK plus one, they are unions. They are obtained by performing some amalgamations on the one in FK. So now this is really what we need, what we ask. So pick an FK, F in FK plus one. So this guy will be constructed from the ones in the previous layer. So then there will be NK plus one, many elements in the previous layer, and a set RF, such that F is the union of these NK plus one many guys. Uh, these guys will form a delta system with root RF. The size of the root will be RK plus one, and the delta system looks like this. So it comes the root, then F0 minus the root, then F1 minus the root, and so on. So for a picture, every element in FK plus one, is the union of NK, NK plus one guys in FK. They form a delta system with root RF, which has size RK plus one, and it comes back in this form. And well, of course, I'm saying that all of the elements in FK plus one look like this, but by no means I'm saying that uh, all of these uh, type of things are in FK plus one, just so. And the delta system uh, mentioned above is called the canonical composition of it. And it is not hard to prove that the, this the composition is unique. And, uh, but the notion of type is exactly what we need in order for all of this to make sense. So, okay, so let's look at type. We have three numbers, MK, MK, RK. MK was the size of the things in MK. NK is how many things in FK minus one I need to glue in order to obtain the one in FK. Or every guy in FK is the union of every guy in FK is the union of n times many things of FK K minus one. And RK is the size of the delta system. Okay, so now let's come back to the definition of type to see why the conditions, what does the condition mean? So we said M0 is one, and this is just because we want F0 to consist of all symmetries. Uh, Mk is at least two. This means that we are always gluing at least two, two blocks. Because if I wanted to just have one, then you are not going to get it. Three, well, that every natural number appears infinitely many times as a root. Uh, but I said this will not be important in these lectures. RK plus one is less than MK. 
So, well, this here is a typo. Well, this is true, but RF, what I really wanted to say is that RF is a subset of F0. So, why do we get this inequality? Well, MK is all this. And RK is just this. So, RK plus what is and MK is all this. So that's why we get this one. And now the weird formula we have is just the delta system. So if I take a guy in MK plus one, then this guy has size. And if I take a guy in FK plus one, this guy has size K plus one. So all of this has size mk plus one. And what's the size of it? Well, it's the root, which has size rk plus one, and mk, mk minus one, mk plus one pieces, and each of these pieces has size mk minus rk plus one. So this formula is just in order for this to make sense for this delta system. Okay, and now the very third step is that uh, constructions like exist. This is without any extraction. Okay. So now I will just put uh, I just again put briefly the definition of construction scheme so that you see it again. That your points in the final, all of the same rank at the same size. Intersection of any two is an initial segment. And Every element in FK plus one looks like this. Uh, it's a delta system and it looks why it's called a root tail, tail, tail. Okay, so are there any questions of the definition, which is the basic definition? Okay. Um, Okay, so now we are going to see some of the basic properties. Um, so we're just going to see a couple of results, which the proofs are very easy. So assume we have k less than L. If I take f of rank k and e of rank L, then the intersection is an initial segment of the one of the smaller one. So the definition of construction scheme says that if you take the intersection of two of the same rank, then it is an initial segment of both. But now if they have different rank, then the intersection is an initial segment of the one of lower rank. Uh, okay, and why is this? Well, remember that we start with F1 being all points. Now, F2 is taking unions of things in F1. F2 is taking unions of things in F3. And so on. Fk plus 1 are obtained by taking unions of things in Fk. So, if I take E, E was the one of, of the bigger rank, which is L. Then E is the union of all L in FK, such that L is a subset of E. Then E intersection F is the union of this L intersection F, such that L is containing E, L is in FK. 
and each of these guys is an initial segment of F. And the union of an initial segment is an initial segment. Okay, uh, so it will not be true in general that the intersection will be a initial segment of the large one. So you can think later of an example, but it's here in the row. Okay, another very important property is if I have K less than L, F in FK, E in FL, and I have F containing E. Then, so if F is containing E, then it is contained in one of the elements of the canonical decomposition. And how do we prove it? Well, you look at the canonical decomposition of E. And assume the lemma, the lemma is false. So, so then it means that uh, F intersects two of the blocks of E. So it looks like this. This is a point in F that it's EI minus RE. And later there is another point of F which is in AJ minus RE. Okay, but then look at AJ intersection F. It's the root and something here, this point, maybe some more. But the point is that, well, the intersection is missing in this point. So the intersection is not an initial set. Okay, so uh, uh, definition. So assume I have take two finite sets of the same size by T E F. This will be the only increase bijection from E to F. So the first point of E goes to the first point of F. The second point of E goes to the second point of F, and so on. Of course, there's only one piece. So if I take two elements in FK, I know they have the same size, so I can look at So B, let's call V. Uh, so what kind of is EF? So the restriction to the intersection is the identity. And this is just because E intersection F is an initial segment of both E and F. So then the the basic variation will uh, preserve, will preserve. So in particular, we get the following. So take any, take any two of the same rank, and alpha that is in both of them, then it's a fixed point. So it means that uh, alpha is in the same position in both F and E. So if alpha is the 283 element of F, then it will be the 283 element of E. It's in the same position of F and E. So this is a very simple lemma. But uh, it's used implicitly all the time. So when we are going to do future constructions, 
where implicitly always going to use this. So if you forget this, is like if you're doing topology and you forget that union of open sets are open, you cannot do anything. It's the same. This appears all the time. Okay. So if I have a subset of omega one, the restriction will be just the elements of the, of, of the scheme that are containing A. And uh, another lemma is that uh, so if I have if I pick two guys of the same rank, then the increasing bijection will move the scheme of in, uh, the scheme of one to the other one. So like the scheme restricted to F will go to the scheme restricted to D. So the point is that they this in terms of the scheme. Uh, F and E look exactly the same. So, but it's not it's not hard to prove this, but uh, it's very easy. The thing is that the structure is quite fixed in a construction scheme. We start with all points, and now to get well, the thing is that how do you construct the cars in F K plus one? are always uh, the root which can size are f and then these guys so there is no options it's always the initial segment which is the root and then i know the other sides of the other ones so everything is fixed everything looks the same yeah so this this is what makes that the construction scheme restricted to any of the elements of the same rank looks the same Okay, so now uh, we want to talk a little bit about uh, ordinary metrics. Oh, here's the definition of metric, but everyone know, knows this. So I'm not, I'm not going to read it. But well, just of course the here is the triangle inequality. But the point is that adding is hard. You learn it in primary school and then a couple of years you forget it. So, so I prefer the notion of ultrametric. In the ultrametric, the, uh, an ultrametric is a metric, but you don't have to add. You change the triangle inequality for just the maximum. So ultrametric spaces are quite common. Uh, for example, in topologies of trees, the topology of well, the, the metric in the, in the verse space or the cantor space with the usual metric is in part of ultrametric. Okay, so what is um uh, an ordinal metric. Well, first, the name might be a little bit. Tricky because it's not a metric. Ordinal metrics are not metrics, but something very similar to that. And in fact, it will be a function that resembles an ultra metric. However, it will take into account the order of omega one. So in here, in the usual case, my points A, B, and C are in the same point. There's no, uh, yeah, nothing distinguishing these three points. But now in omega one, we have a, a, a linear order. So we have a distinction between these two points. Okay, so take D, what is a function that wants to be a metric, an ultra metric, 
and take three points alpha, beta, and gamma and omega 1, with alpha less than beta and less than gamma. So uh, there are three instances of the triangle inequality for the ultrametric. Okay, so it's symmetric. So, uh, so then there are three instances of this inequality. If I take the first point in the left hand side, I can take the left point uh, and the right point, the left point and the middle point, and the middle point and the last point. So here I'm making the drawing. So the, the drawing means that the one in the left is the well, yeah, this one, when there is only one, it means that uh, from the left is less, yeah, the thing that is in the left is less than or equal to the maximum of the ones that are on the right. So these are the drawings from these three, three instances of ultrametric. Now, for an ordinal metric, we throw away the last one. We don't require the last one. So there's no like a priori reason why we throw away this one and we stay with these two. It's just of applications. In terms of applications, this the last one really rarely holds. And, and, well, and there are many functions that satisfy this two. So the, the point is that in nature, it's hard to find this one. And there are a lot of these ones. So uh, an ordinary metric will be something like an ultra metric. But instead of having these triangle inequalities, I will only require uh, the two instances, which by the way, are the two instances where in the last side, left size I have the, the smallest one. The one I'm throwing away is the middle point and the last point. And there's also another property for an ordinal metric, and is that we want like balls to be finite. And as always, if I have a point, you look at any ball. I want them to be finite. Well, almost that, but again, we need to take into account the order of omega one. So, when working with ultra metrics, we are usually not. In, you take a point. We are not usually interested in the whole point, but only in the ones below. Okay, so well, I'm going to have the definition here. An ordinal metric is a function from omega from first of omega one, and this is always in omega, not the real numbers. So the three proper the three first properties of metric must uh, special one special here. The two in only the two instances of the triangle inequality we mentioned before. And I want that if you take for every L in omega, and it should be here, for every alpha in omega one, you look at the volume of center alpha with radius L, but just at the ones that are below alpha. So here we are only interested in the balls of everything below. We want this to be finite. Okay, so ordinary metrics were introduced by Stemo. And uh, well, if you want to learn more about this uh, topic, well, his book on box and ordinals contains a lot of information. Uh -huh. 
So if I have a nominal metric, I look at this, uh, what I mentioned before, the volume of just what is below. The C is less than or equal to alpha, so that the distance is at most L. And what is very helpful to think is that construction schemes are some kind of or in use and ultrametric. So if you have a construction scheme, you can define the function. So what will be the distance of alpha and beta? Well, remember that the construction schemes are cofinite. So that means that there is an element in the construction scheme that contains these two points. So look at the minimal rank of a guy that contains these two points. And this is the, yeah. So it turns out that, oh, ah, okay. Yeah, it's good. Yeah, I mentioned this. So it turns out that this is a non-dimetric. And it's sometimes very helpful to think about this in terms of metrics. And we also have a very simple description of points. If you take alpha and k, what is the k ball of alpha? Well, choose any element of rank k that has alpha in its, that has alpha. So just take alpha and everything below, and that is the volume. So the point is that, well, what, the point is that this is well defined because of what we thought earlier. It doesn't depend on f because if I take two elements p e and f in fk that both have alpha, then the intersection is an initial segment. So then maybe they are maybe they are different after alpha, but before they are the same. So this one is well defined. I shall probably take F that has alpha, it is alpha, and the ball is everything here. Okay, yeah, so this would be like the basic properties of construction schemes. And in the later lectures, we are going to see some application of them. And uh, but I just want to mention that I I wanted to give a lecture on this topic. Uh, well, I'm working with this. Uh, well, I'm not really a super expert on this topic, but it's uh, there are only a few papers. I think with the one we are writing there are only five, so there are still a lot of work to do. And I believe this is a very powerful technique. So I wanted to talk about it and hope that more people get interested. Because I think it, it can be very, very, it can have a lot of very interesting applications. Okay, so this will be the end of the first lecture. Uh, so I always get told to the sound of my just be close and it's not particular. I try to understand how much of this is hard to find that object that I close to the time. There are some forcing the final solution to be financial it's uh, yeah, so, well, first of all, uh, exactly the first application of construction schemes were really forcing constructions uh, with finite conditions that were that have uh, some. The consideration was with uh, some application in, uh, in banner spaces, but precisely the 
The origin of this came from some construction is there will be in some papers, the forcing and then it turned out that they could be somehow axiomatized with this one. So really the origin is, is that that you mentioned. And uh, yeah, and it's possible to prove that if you are uh, omega one point reals, then you are the construction. Well, yeah, you are the construction scheme that has some properties uh, extra from CSC, but precisely uh, instead of thinking that you are adding omega one point reals, it's easier to think about that. But find another representation which is precisely uh, the finite conditions. So it's more or less this. Uh, yeah, there's a very natural force in this condition with finite conditions. Mm -hmm. okay. So, we have 4.30 start the uh, sessions upstairs.